Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Aziz. I am the community engagement curator here at the New Orleans Museum of Art. I uh, had the opportunity today to speak with Shani Peters and Joseph Collier of the Black School, um, currently based in New York. Um, for those who are not aware, the Black School is an experimental art school teaching radical Black history. Um, so as the New Orleans Museum of Art, this summer we were going to have the opportunity to collaborate with the Black School along with community partners such as the Youth Empowerment Project and the Community Book Center, um, working to capture stories from uh, individuals and residents in New Orleans. Unfortunately, obviously, with what's going on in our world today, those plans had to change, um, but we are set to continue this project next summer, summer of 2021. Um, so this opportunity really is to just give everyone a chance to learn more about the Black School, their art practice, and the future project that we will collaborate on together. So um, with that, um, the Black School today will be just telling you, uh, we're calling it story time. So. Um, they will be sharing some perspectives, some stories, and just give you a little bit better idea of what they're about. So with that, uh, we'll kick it to you all. Thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, so we're planning on doing this project in New Orleans this summer, uh, What Makes a School, which activates the mobile unit and does the site-specific story times all around like these larger themes that the Black School is always exploring, like um, art making as experiential learning, um, art as an entry ray into rad radical Black politics, and, um, and how artists can be of service to a community as opposed to just observers or, you know, having this special coveted position in the community, um, how could we turn that upside down and not just think of Black folks or Blackness as a material, but the thing that like we build our entire practice around um, and within. And I think there's three terms that are swirling around my head that illuminates these examples for us and the process we're taking in this question of what makes a school is this idea of politicization, mobilization, and occupation. Mm -hmm. With um, the liberation schools of the Panthers being that politicization and that uh, learning about class consciousness and racial consciousness. And then mobilization being exemplified by the Tuskegee Mobile School and thinking of a school not just as like this place behind a wall, but like this practice of going out into a community and doing this radical act of outreach. Mm -hmm. um, and the third being occupation uh, with the, um, the resurrection city is like once we have our purpose and once we start moving through the world with our purpose once we get to that place where we know we're meant to be then we can start planting roots and um that's kind of this process through this project but also our larger process because we do plan on relocating to new orleans um and so we're engaging in this this short term with the NOMA project, but also long term, like how do we build deeper connections with these community partners like Yep Community Book Center, um, Xavier, uh, and, and a bunch of other local um, organizations, Antenna, um, and individuals. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we see this opportunity as a way to like re we get in touch with those roots we have um, in our familial legacies, like we both come from uh, educator families. Um, and I'm originally from New Orleans. Uh, my, my family has like a long history and legacy in the city as educators. Um, so that's like the major inspiration for what we're doing or what we plan to do next summer. <laughs> Eventually. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, the plan for the, the NOMA partnership is to um, work with the community book center to ide identify different storytellers and to go around, um, among other things, um, and read stories from, from the collection of that um, amazing bookstore. Um, but today we're going to tell you all some stories um, 
of, of Black radical histories that Joseph has already mentioned that, um, that our project is inspired by and that we're just kind of inspired by in general and are thinking about a lot in this particular moment, right? So the first uh, Black radical story is the Liberation School, the Black Panther Movement. Uh, the Black School draws its primary inspiration from the Freedom Schools of the Civil Rights Era and the Liberation Schools of the Black Panther Party. We want to start off today's uh, storytelling um, by talking about one of the BPP's longest running liberation schools and social survival programs in general, the Oakland Community School. We reference this image a lot when we're talking about the Panthers um, and as a way to set intention for our programming. This image was actually taken inside one of the Oakland Community School's earlier iterations, the Intercommunal, Insti the Intercommunal Youth Institute, excuse me. I'm going to read a description of the Liberation Schools written by one of the humans I'm most in inspired by in this world, Ms. Erica Huggins, Black Panther Party member and point person of the Oakland Education Initiatives. Uh, this text is titled Liberation Schools, Children's House, uh, Intermu Intercommunal Youth Institute, and the Oakland Community School by Erica Huggins, 2007. The Oakland Community School was one of the most well-known and well-loved programs of the Black Panther Party. Point five of the Black Panther Party's original 1966 10-point program emphasized the need to provide an education that, among other things, taught African-American and poor people about the history of the United States. To this end, the Oakland Community School became a locale for small but powerful group of administrators, educators, and elementary school students whose actions to empower youth and their families challenged existing education concepts for Black and other poor and radically mar racially marginalized communities during the 1970s and 80s. Historically, however, the education programs of the BPP started long before the OCS with the vision of the party's leaders. As early as 1967, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale began speaking to high school youth at the San Francisco and Bay Area public schools. In, the 19, in 1969, the, in U.S. cities where there were strong BPP chapters, liberation schools staffed by volunteer party members opened in storefronts, churches, and homes. These after-school programs were created to give academic support to Black and other youth. These community school programs created a forum for young people. You gotta be Created a forum for young people to explore a factual history of America and a sense of connection and community. We have a three-year-old. Hello, <laughs> Barbara. <laughs> okay, but you remember that he said you had to be quiet while we're recording. All right. In 1970, in Oakland, David Hilliard created an idea for the first full-time Liberation Day school. This school was simply called the Children's House. This school concept, directed by Maja Smith and a team of BPP members, became the way in which sons and daughters of the BPP members were educated. Staff and instructors were Black Panther Party members. In 1971, this school moved into a large building in Berkeley and then to the Fruitville area of Oakland. The Children's House was eventually renamed the Intercommunal Youth Institute under the leadership of Brenda Bay. The IYI served BPP members and a few nearby families in the Fruitville area, maintaining a day school program and a dormitory for 50 children for two years. In 1967, at the Oakland Community School opened its doors, starting with 90 children. The school enrollment quickly blossomed to 150 and maintained a daunting waiting list. From that time until 1982, the school, directed by Erica Huggins and Donna Howell, was a community focal point for the conscious development of all the innate intelligence, intelligences of the young child. Every child was appreciated for her and his innate wisdom and unique talents. A guiding and global principle of the school was the world is our classroom. This simple, or this principle sprung from the school's philosophy that children at the OCS will learn how, not what, to think. Former students remember starting the day with a 10 minute exercise program, breakfast followed by a short school-wide interactive check-in uh, preceding the morning classes. A nutritious lunch at midday and 10 minutes of meditation in the early afternoon was followed by classes for the older children and rest for the smaller ones. Dinner concluded the day and the school vans transported children who could not walk to their homes. The curriculum was student-centered. 
math, English, and Spanish language instruction, creative writing, physical education, including martial arts, was the base of the class schedule. Art, music, and drama were also a priority. These classes culminated in a school-wide performance, in school-wide performances written by students twice a year. Great human beings, poets, artists, and activists, such as Rosa Parks, Cesar Chavez, Maya Angelou, James Baldwin, Sun Ra, and Richard Pryor, visited and showered the students with their empowering and inspiring presence. Educators and graduate students visited as guest teachers and interns so that they could return to their own state from as close as Sacramento to as far away as Amsterdam. The value of the Black Panther Party education programs did not rest with the early liberation schools. The Children's House, the IYI, or the OCS were able to do with what the Children's House, the IYI, or the OCS were able to do between 1969 and 1982. The legacy lives in the hearts of children who were taught then and will continue to live on in the generations of children they touch. So that's the liberation schools, the Oakland Community School. Um, next, Joseph is going to talk about um, the Booker T. Washington Mo Mobile School. Okay. Well, so so before I guess going to that, um, I just wanted to I guess ask the both of you. I, Joseph mentioned at the beginning, just um, you know, obviously in thinking about the the black schools teaching radical black history, um, I'm curious, and I think I'm sure many of our viewers would be curious as to. Um, what or when was you all's first entryway into uh, radical Black history? Um, yeah. You want to answer first? Sure. Um, my dad is a Black Studies professor um, and has been my whole life. So um, very, very early on, the house was just filled with um, books about um, the Panthers, everything. I mean, yeah, my dad has a very, a very extensive library. Um, and it wasn't until um, I got to grad school that I really realized the significance of that. And, um, and I really took on kind of re-familiarizing myself with those histories as an adult, as an individual versus just, you know, a child taking on somebody else's ideas. Um, so as a child and then really again in like my, my mid-20s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, peripherally, if that's the word, I think uh, I, I came into contact with these histories um, and this, this like this kind of body of thought through coming from a family of educators and my father's big into history and um, also going to black schools for most of my life. But I have to say, when I first engaged with this, it's probably grad school, where I was like doing the research myself and uh, like finding um, thinkers and writers who, for me, like um, set me down this path I'm on now and uh, kind of gave me the building blocks to figuring out how my art practice and my teaching practice kind of live together and that radical black politics was that glue for me like starting with autobiography of malcolm x and also uh bell hooks writings on teaching that kind of like led me down this road and gave me like a uh, kind of battery in my back to research these legacies even further so after being introduced to those writings, then I started to look up like the liberation schools and the freedom schools and saw that there were all these precedents for like this, this approach to my practice that I wanted to take. Um, and and kind of, I think in relation to that, um, you know, when I think about the Black Panther Party, I mean, for me, the first thing that comes to mind is liberation, but Unfortunately, I think for a lot of people, and even some Black people, that is not the case. And so I guess I'm curious um, what you all think, uh, the work that needs to be done to somewhat correct or combat the demonization of some of these histories, like the Black Panther Party, 
or even I think, you know, from my personal history, Bo Du, you know, as a, as a spiritual practice, which has been demonized when in actuality it led to liberation of black people. So just like, what do you all think? Um, obviously you all are doing the work, but I think what do you think collectively needs to be done to really combat these more westernized demonizations of, of our history? Um, well, I think for black people, I think it's a matter of like getting back in touch with those legacies and those histories that we come from. You know, we come from revolutionary black people. Each of each of us, you know, to even have our bloodline survive to this day, we had to come from people who were um, motivated by liberation. Um, so I think voodoo um, in different like ancestral African modes of religion and practice are like great ways to get in touch with our ancestors, whether it be blood or it be just ancestors and thought, you know? So we can, we can take the lessons they taught us, but also like take the, the bravery and the, the wisdom that they have passed down to us that we only just need to tap into to, to, to kind of wash away the demonizations that white supremacist thinking has placed on those movements um, and those philosophies and those spiritualities. Yeah, the other thing I'd add to that is just um, something that we were like really concrete about doing, which is centering our thought in Black love, right? Centering the things that we do, the programming that we do, um, the focus for all of our work in Black love. And I think once you do that, once you approach our histories and our cultures and our traditions from that perspective, it helps you to kind of clear away that that Black hate, right? That anti-Blackness that is around everything, right? And it gets mm -hmm. inside of our heads as well. And so sometimes that's the first filter that we have um, when, we, when we go to think about something like the Black Panther Party or our, our ancestral religions, right? You have to push away from that and, and think about what our ancestors were actually feeling and, and, and thinking when they were making these decisions. And when we, we come to that from a place of love, we see the positive first, right? We see the things that were, were done right first um, and kind of have a, a whole different perspective on it um, that allows us to shift away from that Western perspective and towards one that's, that's really centered in our traditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah.